On February 29, 1948, a pastor was kidnapped from the streets of Romania. He would disappear for 14 years and endure horrific torture for his refusal to renounce Christ. And in the midst of this suffering, he witnessed the incredible power of Christ's love. After being arrested, I spent the next three years in a solitary cell. It was enough to drive any man mad. The martyr Savonarola wrote, there are those who believe in God and those who, just as sincerely, believe that they believe. Now I had to ask myself, did I believe in God? That we are persecuted, but not abandoned. So please do not abandon us. My wife, Sabina, had also been arrested. Sabina, My son, Mihai left orphan. Sabina would spend the next 18 months in a slave labor camp on the Danube. Sabina! Sabina! my darkest hours, my only hope was in prayer. Of course, in prison, prayer was forbidden. In spite of the beatings, I prayed every day. I prayed God would give me strength to endure. And of course, I prayed for my family. My feet were beaten so often and so brutally. I would never walk normally again. I'm sorry if a crocodile eats a man, but I cannot reproach the crocodile. I had learned the same can be said of my torturers. Communism had stripped them of any form of humanity, and only God's love could restore them. Arrested. 
Pentru ce căcate mai roși, mă? Pentru ce te mai roși tu acum? Mă rugam pentru tine. I hate in the sin, but never the sinner. And some we even want to Christ. They did something at the beginning that I have never seen or been a part of. It's called a white table ceremony. And some of you may be familiar with it. I, I was not. But they have a table set up, and then they begin to put different things upon the table, beginning with a white tablecloth, then a red rose, then a lighted candle, then a place setting, a plate, a cup turned upside down, a lemon salt, uh, a black napkin, all of those things to commemorate something. And, and Pastor Matthew would say what that meant. And at the end of all of those things, we would say together in unison, remember. Because why we were being caused and stirred in our emotions and our heart to remember, to remember our veterans, remember the sacrifice, remember the cost, remember those left behind, remember those that never, all these things never, never came, we were to remember. So every time something was placed on the table and it was spoken about what it meant, we would say together at the close of that, remember. Today's a day about remembering. Some of you may, may not be aware, but the month of November is the time that's been set aside to remember and to pray for the persecuted church, for our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering for the cause of Christ, some of them suffering tremendous hardships, things that you and I cannot even begin to fathom or comprehend just because they believe in Jesus. I want to read something. Hebrews 13 this is what it says. It says, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. It says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some have done this, have entertained angels without even realizing it. And then he says this, verse 3, remember those in prison as if you are there yourself. He, he's speaking about believers in prison. Christians who have been arrested just because of their faith. He says, remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. And then I want to just read one of the passages inside of Colossians. It's the Apostle Paul. He writes and he says this at the close of that book, that little letter. He says, here is my greeting in my own handwriting, Paul. He's saying this because he wants them to understand, understand this is his letter. He, he, his eyesight was poor. He usually had somebody to write out his letters for him, but he's signing the end. He's closing it out, and he's saying, here is my greeting in my own handwriting, Paul. And then he says this, remember my chains, and may God's grace be with you. This is the month we're to remember and to pray for our, our, our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ who are being persecuted for simply being a believer, which is sometimes, I think, hard for us to comprehend living here in America because we've never known what it's like to suffer what I would call severe persecution. We don't know what it's like to be, to be threatened with imprisonment or torture or even death just because we believe in Jesus. And yet for the millions around the world, that's the world that they live in. We, we may suffer some ideological discrimination. We may suffer some, some different things at work because of our Christian beliefs or our biblical worldview. But for the most part, we are totally insulated from what's going on in, in places around the world where humiliation and pain 
and homelessness and heartbreak and torture and sometimes even death are part of their daily existence, yet they are willing to endure all of that simply because they say, I am, I am, I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. How many will lift your hand today and say, I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? I'll be honest, I sometimes worry about where we are in the, in the United States. I always think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. They're part of the leadership team. And Nebuchadnezzar makes the great golden idol in his image, and he tells everyone, you've got to bow down, otherwise you're going to have to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And the scripture says that it was only Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I have a feeling they weren't the only Jews that were a part of that group, but they were the only three in that crowd who refused to bow. They did not bow. They, stayed, they kept standing, and they said, listen, if you don't bow, the next time we blow them to the horn, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And they said, you can throw us in. We're still not going to bow. And they, they blew their trumpet. And again, they stood standing. And so they threw them in. But before they threw them in, they made this declaration. We know that God is able to keep us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow. There's a part of me that wonders sometimes where we are in the United States, because we are so insulated, whether or not we have the same fortitude as those around the world. It is said that 80% of all Christian persecution is against Christians. 80%. Think about it. Not only is Christianity the most persecuted religion in the world today, but more Christians were martyred in the 20th century than all the other centuries combined. And it's already being said that if trends continue, that this century, the 21st century, will surpass the last one in total of Christian martyrs. In fact, in China right now, they say that the persecution of believers there is the worst it's been in 40 years. And we would need to remember and to pray for them. In fact, one of the best sources of this kind of information says that every year about 170,000 Christians are being martyred for their faith. In fact, in a recent article by Christianity Today, it said every day... 13 Christians worldwide are killed because of their faith. Every day. Every day, 12 churches or 12 Christian buildings are being attacked. Every day, 12 Christians are unjustly arrested or in prison, and another five are abducted. That's happening every single day to believers, simply because they say that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we are admonished that we are to pray for them. We're to pray. I remember one of our missionaries telling me about a time that he was speaking at a Bible college in East Africa. And he said he was speaking on leadership and sacrifice. And in the course of his lecture, he, he asked the question. He says, how many of you have ever been in prison for your faith? And every hand in the room went, by, went up. And it was a large room of men. He, he thought perhaps that he had not phrased the question correctly, so he said it again. How many men have ever been in prison for their faith? And every one of the hands went up again. So he thought perhaps that he was doing something wrong, so he says to his translator, thought there was a miscommunication with his translator, so he says to him, he says, are they understanding what I'm asking? I'm asking them, has any of them have, have, how many of them have been in prison for their faith? And the young man says, all of us have been. And he looked at him and says, haven't you? It was this realization moment that here he is. He's speaking to a group of men at a Bible college. He's talking about leadership. He's talking about sacrifice. And he realizes that they have already done what he has never done. That they have even been in prison for their faith. We don't know what it's like yet in this country to suffer that kind of persecution. It may very well happen in the near future based upon some of the things that we see happening. And yet... For much of the world, it already is that. For much of the world, there's a cost for believing in Jesus. There's a, there's a cost for bearing his name. And we are called upon to remember them in our prayers. Paul said, remember my change. He's asking them to remember his imprisonment, to remember his suffering, to remember that it's costing him something to make Jesus' name known. He says, remember my chains. Paul's been shipwrecked four times. 
When he writes the letter of 2 Corinthians, he says three times, but he was shipwrecked on his way to Rome. A fourth. He's been shipwrecked four times, beat with rods at least three times. He's been stoned and left for dead. He was in prison in Philippi. He was in prison in Jerusalem. And now he's in prison in Rome. And from this dark, damp prison cell, he endeavors to write the believers in Colossae to strengthen and encourage him. And as he encloses his letter, he wants to remind them that it's costing him something. It's costing him something to share this gospel. It's costing him something to make Jesus' name known. And he says, remember my chains. Why? Because he wants them to pray for him. The writer of Hebrews 13 says, remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. Listen, I'm not sure if it was the Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Hebrews. Nobody's actually certain if it was him or one of his contemporaries, maybe Barnabas, maybe Apollos. Either way, there's no doubt that they themselves had suffered severe persecution. And they themselves knew the feeling of abandonment. They knew the feeling of loneliness. And so we hear their admonition. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. How many today could say, I can, I, can, I can relate to that? None of us can because we've not been in prison for bearing Jesus' name. But we're to try. Remember those being mistreated as if you felt the pain in your own bodies. This is 2 Timothy 4. We read the final words of the Apostle Paul that we have record of. Again, he's in prison in this Roman cell that was more like a dungeon by this time. When he was first arrested and first taken to Rome, he was put under house arrest. He had some liberties. He had some freedoms. He was able to receive guests. But time has gone on. He's been there for some time now, and now he's gone from being under house arrest to he's actually being chained in a Roman jail, a Roman prison. It's more like a dungeon. I've been in that place. It's cold. It's dark. It's damp. And this time he's not going to get released. This time he's not going to be set free. This time there's going to be no miraculous rescue. This time the only thing that is waiting for the Apostle Paul is either the sword, the gallows, or the cross. And he knows it. And so he writes this, and he writes in 2 Timothy 4, As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. We love those words. We know those words because we say them often when somebody that's known Jesus for a long time has passed away. But the paragraph that follows that one is a far cry from those great words of anticipation of a future prize. The next lines are that of a man in the thrones of persecution who is clinging to the support of those he trusts in Jesus the way he trusts in Jesus. And yet in reading them, you get the feeling that he feels forsaken. In fact, in some ways, you get the feeling that he looks at it as like he's been betrayed. He's hurt because he feels like he's alone. He knows that Christ is with him, yet he still feels this sense of abandonment by his friends, those who are supposed to be there for him, to encourage him, to support him, to pray for him. And so he writes to him, he says in verse 9, Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. He's suffering persecution. Death is imminent in the sense that it's not an if, but it's a when. And you can almost hear Paul's emotions speaking. It's as if he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, please don't forsake me during my time of testing. I need your support. I need you, Timothy. And he writes in verse 16. He says, the first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. May it not be counted against them. You can almost hear the disappointment the pain in his words, that feeling of being forsaken, of being forgotten. And he's saying, somebody, please remember my chains. Don't forsake me. Don't abandon me. Don't forget to pray, remember me. Verse 17, he does say that the Lord stood with him and gave him strength that he might preach the good news to his entirety, to the gospel, Gentiles to hear. But in the verse before, 
He says he felt abandoned. Aren't you glad that Jesus never leaves us? Everybody else can forsake us, but Jesus will be with us. My question is, why did everybody leave him? Why would a man as great as the Apostle Paul, why was not someone there to stand with him? The reality is, is that God is calling on all of us especially us who live in such a land as the United States where we have such freedoms and liberties that we can pray anytime we want, wherever we want, and we don't have to worry about anybody busting down the door to drag us to prison. I don't have all the answers as to why Paul was alone. But Paul didn't hold it against anyone. But what Paul faced is literally what millions are facing every day. And friends, though we can't be with them personally, we can be with them spiritually. And we can hold them up in prayers. We can remember their pain, pain, pray, their chains and remember that they're being persecuted for the sake of Christ. In chapter 10 of Hebrews, it says this. It says, think back on those early days, verse 32, when you first learned about Christ. He says, remember how t- you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten. And sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. He says, you suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned were taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things awaiting you that will last forever. Friends, the church has been suffering persecution from its very beginning, which is not surprising. Because Jesus himself said in John 15, because they hate me, they'll hate you. Because they persecuted me, they'll persecute. But then he says in Matthew 5, be happy. Be glad. Because God blesses when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all matters are evil against you because you are my followers. He said, be glad. The Roman historian Tacitus, he writes about the early Christians' persecution in about AD 65 under Nero's regime. And he said this. He says, besides being put to death, they were made to serve as objects of amusement. They were clad in the hides of beasts and torn to death by dogs. Others were crucified. Others set on fire to serve and illuminate the darkness of the night. That's what they did to Christians. Debbie and I have stood in the rubble of Nero's palace and looked down upon the Circus Circus Maximus, which was right in front of his palace, where they would bring the Christians and feed them to wild animals set them ablaze, and crucify them as he sat in his royal box, like an amusement park going today for a ball field, and you had these sport boxes. He had his own private box. I think it's barbaric, but you vote to Nero, it was entertainment. That's what they did to Christians. In the book, The Martyrdom of Polycarp, it says that in AD 155, when Polycarp, who was a Christian leader, was brought to the stadium the Roman proconsul, he urged the old man to curse God, to curse Jesus, and Polycarp answered. He says, for 86 years I have served him, and he's done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? The proconsul threatened him with fire if he refused, and Polycarp answered. He says, you threaten me with fire that burns for an hour, and a little while is quenched, for you do not know of the fire of judgment to come. The fire of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why delay? Bring what you will. And they burned Polycarp to the stake. I remember back in 2013, being over in northern Kenya. We had flown into an area there near the city of Garissa or into Garissa. And so we're leaving there. We're, We're headed out. We're going into an area, the bush, the meet with some leaders out there and uh, we had just left Garissa it's a control by the Kenyan government landed in a little on a dirt little airfield got in two vehicles our group went through the military checkpoints come out of the town and we're gone about 10 minutes and the men that had met us there their phones begin to ring through the vehicles and they get word that we just 10 minutes after we had left the streets out of Garissa that some individuals will with El Shabaab had gunned down one of our Somali pastors 10 minutes after we got off the street 
We had stopped at a Muslim school because we had to get permission from the imam to go further into the bush into what's called his territory. And these guys are, have just gotten the word, and we're being told that this has just happened, and that the military has come in, they've shut down the town. They don't, we don't even know if we can get back out. We may have to drive back to Nairobi. And tears are coming down these guys' cheeks. We can't come together and just pray because we're at the, the Muslim school. So they're told us, he said, just walk around, just get by yourself and just pray. We don't know what this means. We don't know there's going to be other attacks. We don't know this is coordinated attacks. We just, we don't know. And so we just begin to walk off a place and pray. I sent a text to Debbie and just said, volatile situation, just pray. It was about three in the morning here. And she had the church pray for us the next morning. But the guys that knew this pastor, the Somali pastor, tears just rolling down their cheeks. Trying to text their own families because they didn't know if it was a coordinator that their families might be next. That's the reality of what it costs to be a Christian in so many parts of the world. I think about a little three-year-old boy named Joel. He was walking home from church one Sunday clutching his Bible when suddenly he saw men wearing black masks and shooting huge black guns. It was Boko Haram, these militants that were attacking his village there in northern Nigeria. Joel began to run as fast as he could towards his house, but the three men grabbed him and they demanded that he give him his Bible. When Joel refused, one of the soldiers ripped it threw it into a fire nearby. He, he ran over and got a little stick and he was trying to get it out of the fire. When one of the men with his AK-47 came and hit him on the back of the head, knocking him into the fire and he held his foot on him in the fire and says, burn you infidel. The little boy survived. But the point is, that's what's happening in the world. We don't know it here. We don't know what it's like here. And sometimes because we don't know what it's like, we have a hard time processing that. But it's the reality. And we're to remember and to pray for them. Because why? Because they are our brothers and sisters of the Lord. I've been in churches in multiple parts of the world, South America, the Middle East, Africa, Central. I've been... And every time I come together with God's people, wherever that may be, I feel the presence of the Lord. I feel their fellowship together. Why? Because we're the same. We're Christians. We're believers in Jesus. They're our brothers and sisters. And yet they're suffering so many hardships. We're to remember their chains. We're to pray for them. Statistically, it is reported that in 60 nations around the globe that there are 309 million Christians living under conditions of severe persecution with another 450 million Christians within 70 other nations living in situations of severe discrimination and restraint. The worst nations being North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, uh, Pakistan, Eritrea, Yemen, Iran, Nigeria, and India. Sometimes the persecution takes on the form of harassment, but other times it can only be described with words such as torture, rape, enslavement, imprisonment, forcible separation of children from parents, murder, and massacre. The point is that we are not to forget that those who are being persecuted, we're to remember their chains and to pray for them. I personally asked one of our missionaries what he would have me say concerning the persecuted church or how we could pray, and this is what he said to me. He says, when you pray, he says, they don't ask that you pray that they might be taken from it. They don't ask that they might be es escaped from it. They don't even ask that it might be taken away or it might go away. He said, they ask that you pray that they might have courage to endure it. You know what we would be praying? Lord, take it. Lord, remove it. He says, their prayer is that they would have courage to endure it. And that's powerful. Why is that? It's because they know that through their persecution, many are coming to Christ. It was the early church father, Tertullian, who said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. 
And I can tell you emphatically that because of the courage and faith of the believers around the world who are being persecuted, there is a revival that is breaking forth even in the hardest places of our world. By the hundreds and the thousands, people are coming to Christ in China, in Iran, in Iraq, in Syria, and other difficult places in the world. But we need to pray for them. See, the reality is, is our Christian community, it goes beyond North Central Church. It goes beyond Spring. It goes beyond Houston. It goes beyond Texas. It goes beyond the United States. It goes all the way around the world. We need to pray for him. For the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Over 150 years ago, missionaries from Great Britain and Germany traveled to Northeast India to preach the gospel. And during that time, they converted a man and his wife and two children to Jesus. Their spontaneous faith was so great that they began to share Jesus with everyone in their village, except the chief became angry about it. So he summoned the man before the village and he demanded that he renounce his faith in Christ or face execution. This man facing his crucial decision started singing a song that we sing sometimes still today. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Enraged, the chief said to his archers, Shoot the children. And they shot his two children with arrows. As his two children laid on the ground, the chief says, denounce Jesus. Denounce Jesus. And he continued to sing. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. And with that, they shot his wife with arrows. The chief is angry. He said for the last time, he says, now I'll give you one more opportunity, one more. Deny your faith and live. There's only one world, this world. If you don't deny Jesus, you will die. And the man began to sing. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. It is said that eventually the courage of this man and his family would lead to the conversion, not only of the chief, but of his village. We've got brothers and sisters in Jesus who are suffering for bearing his name, being persecuted, being imprisoned, just because they love Jesus. And they need our prayers. I watched a video the other day that was smuggled out of China of them breaking down the doors into a house church and beating them and dragging them away. They kept trying to sing downstairs. They were singing Amazing Grace as 20 plus policemen are banging, are pushing, forcing their way into the home. The children run upstairs and they're filming it. And then they come upstairs and you see them drag them and you know, the kids are yelling, we're just children, we're just children. And they drag them. We don't know what it's like. But the world does. We can't be there personally with them. But we can definitely pray for them. I want to show you one last video. This comes from 2016. The first video we showed you is Richard Wormbrand, who is the founder of the Voice of the Martyrs. If you're not a part of VOM, I encourage you to be a part of VOM. They're doing great work with those persecuted around the world. This next one is about North Korea. I had all those others I wanted to show. There's so many that it's just not enough time. I want you to see this video about Pastor Han. Go ahead. It's for the 
In the primary school, we were taught that all missionaries were terrorists. They told us that a missionary will be nice to you at first, but when they get you into their homes, then they will kill you and eat your liver. There was no food and no work in my village. Like some others, I snuck across the mountain border into China. I picked mushrooms in the hopes of selling them in Chiang Mai. I don't speak Chinese at all. But in the mountains, I met a man. He said, I can sell those for you. And he didn't cheat me. He gave me all the money from the sale. At that time, I didn't know he was Pastor Han. Over the next two years, I went back several times. Each time, Pastor Han helped me. One day, I asked why he would do this for he himself was in great danger for assisting a North Korea. It is because I am a Christian, he said. That made me afraid. Was he going to eat my liver? One day, Pastor Han said to me, God is real. There is hope for every person. I could not believe he would say that word, God. Nobody says that word. We know it is an act of treason. To speak the name of God can lead to soldiers coming in the night. will write about you, and no one will ever dare ask where you have gone. One day I asked Pastor Han for a Bible. He knew that if I was caught with a Bible, my life would be in danger. But over time, I persuaded him. I showed the Bible to my wife. At first, she refused to even look at it. Why would you bring that here, she cried. She knew that if anyone reported that you had even glanced at a Bible, you would be arrested, and not just you. You and all your relatives sent to the concentration camps for years and years and years. Over time, my wife too learned that God is real. She found hope. And then I shared the word of God with my best friend. It was very dangerous for me to share. It was very dangerous for him to listen. Mm. 
one day in the summer of 2016, we heard that some North Korean assassins were being honored by the government, rewarded for their good work for killing a terrorist missionary in Chiang Mai. We knew it was Pastor Han. Who else could it be? We were frightened. Did they know he was my friend? Did they know I had met with him many times? Pastor Han gave his life, but he gave hope to me and to many other North Koreans. And despite the ever-present danger, Many of us will continue to share the message that God is real. We hope that our sacrifice, when the day comes, will be worthwhile, just like it was for Pastor Han. Hebrews 13 says, remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as you, if you felt their pain in your own bodies. For as Paul said in Colossians 4, 18, he says, remember my chains. I want to do something different today as we close. I want us to find a place to pray for the persecuted church, for those who are being physically persecuted today in ways that you can't even fathom or imagine. Today, anywhere between 13 and 19 believers will be killed today. Today, 12 churches will be attacked. Today, 12 Christians will be mistreated horrendously and five will be abducted. We know this is actively going on. We're part of a, of a chain group of ministers and prayer partners with a group out of East Africa. And there are those that have come to Jesus in a certain country over there. That when they come to Jesus, I'm telling you, it, it, their world is upside down. And so many times, I, we'll get the list, so-and-so has been abducted. Start praying. Start praying. So-and-so has been abducted. And the things that they've had to endure and are enduring and will endure. But they're willing. They're willing. Because Jesus means that much to them. How much does Jesus mean to you? How much does Jesus mean to you? You know, Daniel in the lion's den, we, we love the story. We like to talk about it. We tout it, the fact that, you know, he, he slept on some lion's manes because, you know, God shut the lion's mouths. But he was willing to pray with that as a potential punishment. Like Richard Wormbrand that we watched at the beginning. They just kept beating him every time he, but he stepped, kept praying. I'm, I'm, I'm so concerned that if the government tomorrow said, this is what we're doing, how many would say, okay, that's right. We won't, can't do that no more. Or do we think about our faith? It's not just something that we, that we say, but something that we are, that Jesus lives in us and everything about us belongs to him. And so we're willing to stand for him no matter what, even if it meant us going to prison. I want us to find, I want us to get together and pray with our families. 
Can we, as families, gather together? Can we come around the front and can we pray? I know it's time for Bible study to start, but I'm going to tell you what, prayer makes a difference because somewhere in the world right now, there's people that are suffering right now. Somewhere, perhaps in North Korea, even now, there's doors that are being kicked open in China where the churches sometimes have to meet underground in caves. I know the churches in Iran, some of those places, they have to get on school buses because they have to be moving all the time because they can't be in one location because they'll be attacked. So they have to keep the church moving. Can we get together? Can we just pray for our brothers and sisters? I know it's a different kind of service, but friends, we need to pray. Prayer is effective. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, a righteous woman. There's power to it. It availeth much. Can we get together? Can we just pray? Can we put it in perspective? If it was us in prison, if it was us being chained, if it was us being left homeless, if it was us being threatened, wouldn't we want somebody praying for us? Let's pray for them. Can we do that? Take three minutes, five minutes. Can we just get together and pray right now? We're so blessed in the United States, but others are not so blessed. Let's pray for them. Can we do that right now? Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back I have decided to follow Jesus Decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though not go with me. Still I will follow No none go with me Still I will follow No none go with me Still I will follow No turn it back No turn it back 